My name is Channing Jackson. Today is Wednesday, April 8th, 2016, and I am at Utah Valley University George Sutherland Archives in Orem, Utah, interviewing Melinda Han for the purposes of Utah Women's Walk. Today we are going to be talking about Belinda's life and her contributions to life in the state of Utah. So can we ask you a couple of questions about where you were born, where did you attend school, just a little bit of background information. Definitely. I was born in La Mesa, San Diego County, California. That's inland about 20 miles from the beach and about 15 miles from Mexico. So beautiful place. Um, I went to a private or a, a charter performing arts school there growing up called FAME. Fine, the, it's called Fine Arts Magnet Education. Um, and then after that, I went to Greenfield Junior High and El Capitan High School in Lakeside. And then my family moved to Utah in 1993. And I went to Lehigh High School for the, the remaining three years of high school. After that, I went to Snow College, and then UVU, and then Gonzaga, and then I'm finishing my EDD at Creighton. Okay, tell me a little bit about your family life, your parents, siblings, your birth order. Yeah, so I'm the oldest of seven, and I have two parents, as we all do, right? <laughs> um, my parents have stayed married. They were married in 1977, September 1st. I was born October 9th, 1978. So they got started right away. Um, I'm almost exactly 20 years older than my mom. I have five brothers, Clark, Branton, Michael, Spencer, and Jonathan. And I'm 10 years older than Jonathan, who's my youngest brother. So we're all about two years apart. And then um, my parents always said they wanted a couple more kids and ideally another boy, another girl. And they tried and tried for years, for 11 years, and just kind of gave up after a few, you know? And my mom was going to UVU with me at the time. She hadn't finished uh, an associate's degree yet. So we were going to school together and I'll never forget when she pulled me, or she, she had a VHS video in her hand and she said, hey, you wanna see something? And I was like, wait, you went to the doctor today? And I was 21. And I had just moved home for a few months to, because I had just transferred from snow and a few things anyway. And she, uh, I said, mom, are you gonna have another baby? <laughs> and I got to watch the video and see that finally, after 21 years, I had my sister. And so I have a little sister now, her name's Christina. She is amazing, and she um, she is 17, almost 18, or almost 17, almost 17. What were the important memories that you have from your childhood? So there's seven that I wanna talk about. The birth of each of my siblings, and then um, a really neat experience I had with my grandfather, my mom's mom. So I, I don't remember when Clark was born. He's just a couple years younger than I am. But I remember when Branton was born. He's the next one, he's third. We were living in this apartment behind my grandparents' house in El Cajon, California, which is where I grew up, and it, my dad's parents. So um, my mom's parents were in the military, traveled quite a bit. My dad's parents lived in California their whole married life. So we were living in an apartment behind their home and I, I'll never forget this, I don't know why. The washer and dryer were out like on a porch because in San Diego you don't, it doesn't snow or get really cold or anything crazy. So I remember standing by the dryer and my parents had just, um, just come home from the hospital. Oh, no, no, my dad had just come home from the hospital. My mom was there having my brother Branton. And I said, so is it a girl? Are we gonna name her Christina? Because that was my thing. Like, I'm going to have a sister and we're going to name her Christina. And uh, I, I'll never forget when my dad told me it was a boy. I was so mad. I like slammed the dryer door. I mean, I was only five or six, but <laughs> anyway, so that was Branton. And then Michael, um, my dad went on a, a motorcycle trip with his friend 
And they were out in the boonies on their motorcycles, and my mom was so close to having my brother Mike. And I'll never forget my mom saying, I can't believe your dad left me here, and I'm about to go into labor. Anyway, he got home in time. Um, they brought my brother Mike home, and it was the first time that my, I can remember my, my mom's parents coming to help out while my mom was um, in the hospital with my brother Michael. Uh, and then Spencer, he was like the cutest one. And he just dark, had this dark, dark hair, and he's the only one of us that doesn't have blue eyes. And so it's just cute and chubby baby. And then my brother John, uh, we, I was pretty sure John was the last one, but I was wrong. Anyway, so I relished every minute, plus I was 10, so I was old enough to really help with diapers, and I got to hold him and babysit him and all of that great stuff. Um, anyhow, so when he was born, he was just my special little buddy. We did a lot together growing up. I made... <laughs> I would make him sing with me in the car when I'd take him places. Um, and so there's this little song from Annie, the, the show, not like the new show, but the old show. Um, I can't remember, let me see if I can remember how it goes. It's, yesterday was playing awful, and I'd make him sing, you can say that again. And then I'd sing, yesterday was playing awful. And then we would sing the rest of it together. Anyway, he, he is just, a good guy. <laughs> he would go right along with it. Um, and then the night my sister was born, I was headed to a, a retreat for UVUSA, which is the student association here at Utah Valley University. I was on student government. And we were headed up to Sundance to um, Dr. Hartman, the gentleman that invented the color code. Um, we were headed up to his cabin because his daughter was one of our vice presidents anyway. It was snowing and the roads were so bad um, at the beginning of December, December, December 10th. And my friend Carrington and I stopped by the hospital, Timpanogos Hospital in Orem. And I went in and my mom hadn't had the baby yet. And so I said, okay, I'm going to go to this retreat and then I'll stop by on my way back. And by the time I got back, she'd had my sister and here's this woman who's 41 years old, having a baby, <laughs> having raised practically all the rest of her kids. Um, probably one of the coolest things of my life. And the last one I wanna share, uh, my grandpa Bowen, my, dad, my mom's dad, he was in um, se different br several different branches, branches of the military and he, he wasn't really active in the LDS faith. We're, we're LDS, we're members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Um, my dad's parents are the first converts in, in, on his side of the family. And my, my mom's mom has pioneer stock back to the 1800s, you know. Um, and then my mom's dad is a convert. So my grandparents met, I don't even know, Colorado, I think. Anyhow. So my grandfather, amazing, grew up with really a strong, strong faith in God in his, in his home, but wasn't, he had, he liked to smoke and drink coffee and, you know, all the good stuff. <laughs> so uh, he wasn't ever really active, but definitely somebody that had the biggest influence on me growing up. Um, and I'll never forget standing in the hallway of our home in Lehigh. We lived behind the brick plant just off like 1200 West in, in uh, Lehigh. And my dad had built the house that we lived in there. And you walk in the front door and there's stairs that go up to the second level and then there's a den on the right and there was like a sitting room on the left and then a hallway that went back to the kitchen. And my grandfather pulled me into that hallway where nobody could see us. He pulled out his wallet, opened it up and pulled out a temple recommend that had just been signed by his stake president. And uh, he's, he's my best friend, one of my best friends. And for him, he hadn't told anybody yet. I mean, my grandma knew that my mom didn't know yet. And to have him show me that first uh, meant the world to me. I'll never forget that. 
Um, anyway, he died a couple years after that. Is there one experience from your early beginnings that you think prepared you for your life work? Yeah. Um, I have five brothers. I got really good at telling people what to do uh, and fighting. <laughs> no, uh, in all sincerity, though, I just had, I always wanted to be in charge, probably the birth order thing, like being the oldest. But then I also, I could see that there were better ways of getting things done. And I just was like, man, if I was in charge, I could get in there and do this, this, and this. And I was embarrassed about those feelings as a kid because I thought, oh, that's so prideful or whatever. But I look back now, and really, it was just this desire to, to learn and become and help things become better. And it wasn't that I wanted to be in charge. It was that I just had this desire to serve. Who were the women you admired growing up? Did you have one particular person that influenced you or mentored you that you feel you had a particular influence in? You know, there's a handful of women that, um, that really made a big difference in my life. And the only ones I really, that really face-to-face -face mentored me were, was my, the only one was my mom. Um, my mom is the most kind, patient. She has more charity than anybody I know. And when she has absolutely nothing, she still gives and I she's shown me that even when you're 41 you can have a kid and you can finish a degree <laughs> and you can finish raising five crazy boys uh, really who I am is because of my mom but there's a few other women that because uh, having your mom is so integral and key to your foundation but then there's also other people that have influenced me a little. Um, grow, growing up in San Diego, there's not a lot of there weren't a lot of LDS women, uh, so most of the women that were around me, I felt like I couldn't identify with. So I would go to this little bookstore that had um, Latter Day Saint materials in it, and I would buy cassette tapes that had lectures on them, <laughs> and I have all, I, I'm pretty sure I still have this in a box somewhere all of Ardeth Capp's tapes that she had put out. And I listened to those. When I got a car, I, got, I had a tape deck in my car, and I would listen to them over and over and over and over and over and over again. And so I'd have to say, Ardeth Capp has had a huge influence on my life, even though I met her for the first time just a few months ago. Um, and then uh, there's a woman named Jan Hunsaker. It was Jan Shelton. She directed some musical theater productions I was in, and she just was one of those people that I saw. She got an education. She was okay being single. She got married when she was in her 40s, um, and she just had this awesome life, and, uh, and she, w she was passionate about something, and I learned a lot from her. What were some of the activities you enjoyed and participated in as a teenager and young adult? So, uh, as a teenager, I was involved in musical theater quite a bit. I studied vocal performance in my early college days and as well as through high school. I was in a lot of, what are they called, um, show choirs, yeah, and madrigal choir kind of things. Um, so, that was like all encompassing my whole life until my sec the summer after my first year in college I had this really cool job to perform in Taiwan and um, in Taipei and at the last minute our, my contract got canceled and I was like what am I gonna do like I can't get a singing job in Utah Lagoon already hired <laughs> and so uh, I in fact I didn't even find out my contract was canceled until I was at the airport my luggage was on the plane. My grandparents had come up from another part of Utah to see me off. My parents were there. And I, I finally called my director because I had the plane tickets for everybody in my troop that was going. I called my director and I said, look, nobody's here. What's going on? And she's like, 
oh, I forgot to call you. <laughs> so the plane was delayed for a few hours while they got my luggage off and I went home. And through a series of crazy events, I ended up working at Boy Scout camp. And that's <laughs> that summer, Schofield Boy Scout camp. It's on Schofield Reservoir in um, kind of on your way to Eastern Utah. You go up Spanish Fort Canyon and turn off and you go through these really great aspens and then you get to Schofield and there's sagebrush and a lake. <laughs> um, I was the commissary director there the first summer, my first summer working there. And uh, it was awesome. I ordered and delivered all of the food for the Boy Scouts to cook in their campsites. And I got to know some really fabulous people. I learned how to sail. I learned how to scuba dive. No, not scuba dive, snorkel. Um, I got to hike, and that's where my passion for the out of doors started. And I worked at Schofield Boy Scout Camp and Mapledale Boy Scout Camp and got to help out with Beaver High Adventure Base a little bit. A and I worked at Oak Crest LDS Girls Camp as a counselor. And uh, anyway, it was a lot of fun. Please tell me about your courtship and marriage. <laughs> Awesome. So my husband, and this is like a, this part is true a hundred percent, even though it sounds like something you'd read in like a really, cre like really poorly written romance novel. <laughs> so we met at church and I was sitting at the front of the chapel on one of the front pews and I turned around and I saw this guy on the very back pew in this navy blue suit red tie, crisp white shirt, perfectly trimmed haircut, and he was just like this buff, hot, like handsome, and I thought he would never go out with me, but he is so handsome. So I turned to the girl next to me, and I said, hey, do you know that guy in the back? Because I had just moved to the area, and she'd been in the, in the uh, congregation for a few years, and she said, no, I've never seen him before, but I'll find out who he is this week at one of our, the church activities, and I'll let you know. So the next Sunday, she came to church, and, and uh, oh, I forgot to say this. So literally, when I turned around, I, everybody was like in this haze, and all I saw was like this perfectly in focus, gorgeous man. <laughs> so the next Sunday, she said, okay, I met him. His name's Jared. He's from Las Vegas. And he's really nice. He didn't look nice, though. He has this, like, I'm going to kill you look. <laughs> I don't know why. He's just, like, got this tough look on him. He is the kindest, most loving, amazing man. So I said, okay, I'm, I'm going to go sit by him in Sunday school. But really, like, I'm super shy. So I would have never actually done that. I was just talking big to look cool, you know. I was 28. He was 28. Um, Anyway, so he went to Sunday school in the Relief Society room, and I told my friend, okay, I'm gonna go sit by him, and then I like dragged my feet as long as I could, hoping that I could, there was no way I could sit by him. Well, I walked in to Sunday school, and when you walk into the room, um, the teacher stands at the front, and then there was like uh, a dozen rows of chairs in front of me with an aisle down the middle, so there were rows on each side. And he, there was a chair at the very front. And of course, I'm like 15 minutes late for class. I'm not going to walk to the front of the classroom. That's totally embarrassing. And then on the very back row, there was him and a chair next to him that was open. And those were the only two open seats in the room. And I was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> so I went up to him and I tapped him on the shoulder and I said, hey, is anyone sitting next to you? And he said, no, I've been saving it for you. For real. And I went and sat next to him and was trying to get up my courage to talk to him. But I thought, no, like, just so much self-doubt, like, there's no way I'm good enough. There's no way he's going to want to talk to me. Um, and all of a sudden he goes, so what's your name? And we totally talked all through Sunday school. Everybody around us was so mad because we were talking. And over the course of the next couple months, we progressively started spending more and more time together. 
I thought we were just hanging out and I loved it. He was hilarious, um, super funny, um, smart, kind, really a very unique and strong belief in our Savior Jesus Christ and in the atonement to really heal heal some pretty deep wounds that he'd experienced. And uh, that, that was what I was looking for. And one night we were sitting on the couches in his mom's living room. And the living room was kind of long, so she had the longer couch on the long wall, then there's a fireplace, and then like a, a short, the love seat. And his brother was there, his brother Kimball, who's like 13 months younger than him. And Kimball was hanging out with us, Jared was sitting on the long couch here, I was sitting across the room on the other couch. Kimball, his brother, stands up and says, all right already, are you guys going to sit by each other? <laughs> and I was like, what is he talking about? Like, I like Jared, but I'm not about to make the first move. Like, I've dated a lot. I'm, I don't want to ruin this friendship. Well, when Kimball said that, I stood up, went and sat by Jared. Kimball went downstairs, and uh, Jared turns to me and says, now that we've been dating for a few months, and I was shocked and I was grateful. I was so excited. I was like, we have, we've, and I didn't say it out loud, but in my mind, I'm thinking we've been dating for a few months. This is awesome. Uh, and anyway, from there on, it just was all downhill. And we, um, we, it was, he was just amazing. And honestly, I didn't know how, what a good person I got until after we were married. Like I knew he was awesome and just exactly what I was looking for. But each year, he just gets better and more kind and loving. Um, I understand that you have two dogs. What are what has been some rewards and challenges of being a dog owner? So my husband and I we're both from big families. He has like five or six sisters and two brothers, and and so when we were dating, we're like, okay, we're going to have a dozen kids. That's what we had decided even though we were almost 30 when we got married. <laughs> and really, I, that would put me into like almost my 50s having kids. <laughs> but that's what we wanted. We wanted a big family. And when we figured out that that just wasn't going to happen anytime soon, um, we got dogs. We started with Doc. Doc is a piebald, and he, which is a, he's a miniature dachshund and a piebald in coloring. So he's white with these big brown spots on him. And if you shave his, he's a, a long hair. So if you shave him, you can see like little freckles all over, brown freckles. And he's got this black, he's got these sable colored ears. So kind of like that red with the black, black hair along the ears. Oh, just so sweet. So we got him when he was eight weeks old and our lives haven't been the same. Like, I haven't been as happy ever in my life. Um, I, I just, I don't know, I, I can't say enough about it. He's just so cute. However, we decided not to um, fix him because he was so cute and so well-tempered. We thought, well, he'd be a great, he'd be, we'd get some great puppies from him. So he pees on everything. <laughs> Like, everything. And in fact, last night, we were over at my friend Marcy Dagley's house. That's a funny story, too. Like, we actually grew up in San Diego together. Now she lives down the street from me. So we were over at her house, and Doc comes in and promptly pees in several places in her house. And I could not believe it. He is potty trained. He knows to go outside. He knows not to pee inside, but he still has to tell everyone that he's the man. <laughs> and that this is his his spot. Uh, so with him, that's probably the most embarrassing. <laughs> um, and then about a year after we got Doc, we got Pepper. They're about six months apart. And Pepper's a miniature dachshund as well, but she's a smooth coat and she's black and tan. So she kind of looks like a Doberman pincer. And she is crazy. So Doc he, he'll climb up and put his head on your shoulder and just put his paws around your neck and hug you and cuddle you. 
Uh, but Pepper, she, she doesn't do that. She jumps really high on her back feet and she's like excited all the time and she licks nonstop. It doesn't matter what we've tried to train her to do. She doesn't, it doesn't matter. She'll still like everybody and everything and she's just so happy and excited. Um, but that's the thing that I loved about her and why I wanted her so bad because she just loves and is so peppy. I didn't know what to name her when I got her because she actually had the same name as one of my cousins. And I was like, I'm not gonna have a dog named after one of my cousins. That's, I don't want my cousin to feel bad. So we changed her name and I didn't know what to change it to. And I was on the phone with my mom. I'm like, mom, I don't, I don't know what to do. And I was on a Dr. Pepper craze at the time. And my mom's like, well, she's kind of crazy. So you could do Pepper and then you'd have Doc and Pepper, like Dr. Pepper. <laughs> and so we named her Pepper. So my mom, made, my mom named her. Okay. In 2004, you graduated from UVU with a bachelor's degree in behavioral sciences. Then in 2014, you graduated from Gonzaga University with a master's in organizational leadership. You then continued your education in 2014, where you were earning a PhD in interdisciplinary leadership studies at Creighton University. Um, can you tell me a little bit about this educational journey, uh, what your motivation to continue on was, and how did you do it? I never thought I'd get a college degree. I'm first gen, which means I'm the first person in my family in actually in multiple generations to receive a college degree. Um, and I was the first one in my immediate family too, because I'm the oldest and the best, right? <laughs> no. Uh, so I started at Snow, actually, I'll never forget driving down the, the street in Lehigh, seeing a sign outside the 7-Eleven that said, managers wanted 20, $28,000 a year plus benefits. And I thought, I could do that. Because my parents had always told me, you have to go to college, you have to go to college. But being first gen, they didn't know that there were some other things that needed to happen to prepare me to get there. And so I was like, no, I'm not gonna go to college. I wanna be a manager at the 7-Eleven, which is an awesome job. But the more I thought about it, the more I thought, yeah, that's an awesome job and I probably would love it, but I, I feel like I need to go to school. I don't know how. I remember going into my counselor's office um, at Lehigh High School and I said, I wanna go to college, but I don't know how to do it. Can you help me? And I was advised not to go to college. I was advised um, to maybe look at some technical training, which is great too, but I didn't feel like that was my path. And when I said, well, I, I don't wanna do that, I, I really wanna go to college, um, my counselor pointed to this filing cabinet on the floor. This was before things were electronic, right? <laughs> she pointed to the filing cabinet on the floor and said, well, you can find applications in there. And I said, okay. And I walked out and as I opened the filing cabinet drawer, I started crying because I was so overwhelmed. I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know how to even find things in a filing cabinet, let alone find the application and then know how to fill it out. And I was so overwhelmed. And I'll never forget um, this woman who was one of my neighbors. She was volunteering in the advising center that day. And she saw me start to cry and she said what's wrong <laughs> and I told her and she said well where do you want to go to college and I said well I think I'd like to go to Snow College because my mom had gotten a scholarship there and she's always told me she regretted not going there she ended she went did a semester at Utah State and turned down the scholarship at Snow so um, she her name's Mrs. Baird Mrs. Baird said, okay, here's the Snow College application. She showed me how to find it in the filing cabinet. She showed me how to fill it out. She gave me phone numbers to call to find out about scholarship auditions. She knew that I, I had been singing and doing theater 
And she gave me all of the tools I needed to run. And I turned in my application. Um, we called the school. I got an opportunity to audition for a vocal scholarship, which I got. I applied for a leadership scholarship, which I got. Um, and I, I'll never forget coming home. My grandfather passed away. My, my dad's dad passed away that sp the spring of 96, right before I went to college. So I was gone for a few months in San Diego. And then uh, when I got back, there were three letters for me from Snow College. And I knew for sure they were all going to be rejections. I didn't know that I didn't know what open enrollment meant. Snow College is open enrollment. That means it didn't matter how cruddy my grades were. I was still going to get in, but I didn't know that. Nobody had, had explained that to me. So I opened the first one, and it said, congratulations. We want you to come to Snow College. I was, I thought, oh my gosh, I don't even know what to do. <laughs> I opened the next one. Congratulations. We want to offer you a full tuition scholarship. I opened the next one, and it said, congratulations. We want to offer you a half tuition scholarship. I was able to move scholarships around to get my fees paid for that first year and my tuition paid for. And uh, all, I, all we had to figure out from there was how to pay for housing. And I, did, and I didn't eat a lot that year. <laughs> I had a lot of rice, a lot of pasta, uh, and went on a lot of dates. So that was, that was how I started. D does that answer the question for you? Oh, I do have to say, I totally thought I was going to get married, like the, my first year there. I dated up a storm. Um, and then my other grandfather passed away my second year in college, my grandpa Bowen. And life was just a little bit hard for a few years after that. And I moved home, and that's when my sister was born. And I transferred to UVU, and uh, I actually wasn't going to continue my studies, but my mom kept saying, no, just come to UVU, just come to UVU. And I, I remember walking in, just trying to figure out heads from tails, because UVU is such a big university. And there was a flyer that they, need, they, they had scholarship opportunities in the Service Learning Center, and a gentleman named Mike Jensen was in charge of service learning. So I called Mike Jensen from a campus phone while I was on campus. I said, hi, my name's Belinda, and I was so nervous. I have really bad anxiety. I was about to pass out. Anyway, he said, you know, I don't think the Service Learning Center is the best place for you. What if I could give you a full tuition scholarship to be involved in student government? So I was able to keep going to school. I finished my associate's degree in 2001. It took, it took me from 96 to 2001 to finish my associate's degree. And then um, the next, the reason I got my bachelor's degree was my academic advisor then. So Mike helped me get my associates. And then Carolyn Johnson, who's no longer an academic advisor, she's now the assistant director of accessibility services. She, she was my academic advisor and I, we were so excited that I, I got my, my associate's degree. And she said, so what are you going to do for your bachelor's? And I just remember bawling, and I'm like, Carolyn, I barely graduated from high school. Yes, I have an associate's degree, but it took me five years to get my associate's degree. There's no way I'm smart enough or good enough or worth it to get a bachelor's degree. And she looked at me and said, what are you afraid of? And I realized I was afraid of failing. And she said, OK, so what if you fail? And for the first time in my life, I realized that nothing bad was going to happen if I failed. Like, she said, so if you fail, you try something different. Or you try it again. It's not a big deal. And I did so much better in the last two years of college finishing my bachelor's degree than I did in the first five. <laughs> and or the last three, however long it took me. Um, and it was interesting because that gave me enough confidence to go on. I took a little break, then went on, got a master's, and that gave me enough confidence to go on and start a doctorate.
According to statistics, many women in Utah do not finish their college education. As an educated woman, is there any advice you would give to women seeking their college degree or how important it is? First of all, when you're raising your own kids, let them know that education is just as important as everything else. Just as important as their desire to get married. Just as important as a desire to be a mom. Um, and education is right up there with it. It's not below it. It's not second. It's not something that you'll do if you have time or if you don't get married. It's a priority. Something I loved, um, my husband went to BYU. He just graduated. <laughs> like he started, he started college when he was 32. So he just finished a year ago. So we were living on campus at BYU when we were in our mid 30s. Everybody was like 20, 21, 22, 23. It was really interesting. But something I loved about, uh, about the people we lived around on campus there was that the husbands and wives, yeah, they may have gotten married young, but they were both in school and both supporting each other through school. Some of them had kids, and they would arrange their schedules so that somebody would always be home with, the, with their children, but they both supported each other still to finish their degrees. They got it. They got the education. Yeah, family and marriage is so important, but education is just as important. And uh, so I think that is what I would say. No matter where you came from, like, yeah, we've got our BYUs for those folks that maybe had, a, had it a little bit, have, have a good GPA in high school, right? <laughs> um, but those of us that struggle academically, there's places for us. We can get a good education, and we can be instrumental in the success of our society and our families. What is it like to be the director of the Center for Advancement and Leadership? What are your duties and responsibilities, and what are some goals you're trying to achieve? Um, being the director is cool. It's fun. <laughs> I really like it. I get to I get to work with and be with really really awesome people. Working on a university campus is really unique, I think, because people are they're not here for themselves necessarily, at least in general. They're really here because they want to see students like you succeed. They're here because they love people and they love seeing people be able to rise above their circumstances. So, that's something I love about being here. Specifically with my job, I get to, we have a, I have an assistant director and a full-time administration, administrative assistant. And then we have student employees and some other fun people we, we get to work with in our office. My assistant director oversees the LEAD program, which is a leadership certification program that is ranked number two in the world right now. And last year, it was ranked in the top 10% in the world. Um, it's, it's pretty amazing. And my assistant directors have always done a wonderful job with that. Students that go through the program meet with community mentors, so they're making connections with current leaders. They take coursework on leadership. They get to do hands-on leadership ex um, experiences. And the students, when they come out the backside of the program, in the mix, sometimes they get frustrated because there's a lot of reflecting and like you have to apply what you're learning. But on the, in the end, I still I get letters and emails and phone calls from students that say, I'm really sorry that I told you it stunk while I was in it. But now that I'm out of it, it's the best thing I ever did. So that's a really cool thing I get to be a part of. Um, I also get to work with a volunteer advisory board consisting of leaders from our com local community and they do fundraising. Um, they do a golf tournament every year. Last year we raised eleven thousand dollars in scholarship money from that. The year before it was ten thousand. This year we're hoping to double it and do like about twenty thousand dollars for scholarships. Um, and those are cash scholarships so our students that might have already have fifty other scholarships they can get this one too. And if everything's paid for at the university, they get a check back so they can buy groceries or pay rent or maybe buy a new pair of shoes or whatever they need. So 
uh, I love that part of my job. And then I also get to, I supervise a concurrent enrollment class called Principles of Leadership. It's out of our School of Management, and I have 20, about 25 high school teachers throughout the state that teach this class at, on their high school campuses. So I get to work with them and help them keep their knowledge base up to, up to speed with the current trends, and yeah. Okay, statistically speaking, men in Utah hold the majority of upper management positions. Based on this statistic, did you find it challenging in your progress, in your um, career? What advice would you have to offer women that would like to move up into a higher position? So I'm only in middle management, which means I'm not, I haven't reached those higher positions. So I don't know that I have any great advice for that. But I do have to say that uh, for me, self-confidence played a huge role in where I'm at. I feel like I, my lack of self-confidence held me back really some of the biggest trials I've had in my life were because of my, myself. <laughs> like, I got in my own way. I didn't know I was getting in my own way, but I did. And so, just remembering that men apply for jobs when they're only 70% qualified, right? So how come, oh, 60% qualified, thanks for clarifying. So why do I feel like I have to be 100% qualified? I'm good enough. If it looks interesting to me, if you look, if it looks like something you want to do, apply for it. The worst they can do is tell you no, and that's not going to hurt you. Okay. What are what were some of your biggest challenges and disappointments in your career, and how did you deal with them? One of the biggest challenges that I I te I don't know why this this bugs me always but I I don't get why people aren't honest and I remember the first time I had to deal with that it was I can't go into details but it was it was quite a while ago and my supervisor asked me to lie about some uh, some financial things I didn't know what to do <laughs> here I was there was the supervisor whom I respected and loved, and uh, I was being asked to do something dishonest. And to be quite honest with you, I never said anything because I didn't know what was right and what wasn't. What was, what was the standard? What, like, was it really as bad as I thought it was, or was I just being extra sensitive? And that, I look back on that learning experience I always speak up now. <laughs> even, if, even if it's probably okay, I still say something because I want to make sure I'm 100% honest all the time. And so, and those little experiences kind of happen throughout, your, throughout my career. I've seen them sprinkled, not a ton, but sprinkled through. Those are the hardest things, knowing that somebody isn't being honest and that I can't trust them because I'm so, I, I tend to be really trusting and I, I would hope that other people are just honest. I understand that you're a real champion for leadership. How did you develop this characteristic and what experiences have you had in helping others succeed? Becky White. Becky White. So when I was at Snow College, I was on a leadership scholarship there as, as well as a vocal performance scholarship. To keep my leadership scholarship, I had to take a leadership class. Becky White was my teacher and my advisor for student government there. I sat in that class and I thought it was the coolest thing <laughs> I had ever, like I had no idea that you could learn about cool stuff like this. Like just different leadership styles and different ways to communicate and how to better understand people and I mean all of these amazing things and I was hooked that was my first year of college my first quarter before we had semesters it was my first quarter and I I still have my snow college binder 
that has all of the things that I wrote about, all of the handouts I got during the time I was there, everything. That was my jumping off point. Becky was like the first person to show me that this could be a career. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> Tell me the last part of the question there again. What experiences have you had in helping others succeed? So, I don't want to, I hate saying stuff because I don't want to be, I don't want to sound prideful. So I'm going to try and not undercut what I did, but also try and not sound prideful. <laughs> but um, one day in my office here, this woman walked in and I had never seen her before. And, her, and she said, I, I want to I wanna be in a leadership program. Do you have a leadership program for, for faculty and staff? And my, my front, front desk assistant said, we don't. And the woman just kept pressing, well, I want to talk to your director then. So an appointment was made, and I met with this woman. And she said, I've been passed over for um, promotions and things because I just don't have some of these important leadership skills. Can you help me? And I remember thinking, oh my gosh, I have no idea <laughs> if I can help you or not. Like I've been focusing on student leadership, you know, and, and I said, okay, well, I just started asking her questions and, and she came up with the idea. I said, well, we don't, we don't have a formal leadership program, but do you want to come meet with me once a month? And we'll just kind of chat. So for one, once a month, for a few months, she came in like three months, and we just chatted. By the end of that third month, she had come up with this idea. She said, look, you need help um, setting goals, doing your strate strategic plans. Can I help you with that? And I said, sure, that would be awesome. I totally need that. And she said, that would help me gain some confidence in, in my language skills. She's English is her second language. However, she has a doctorate from an English-speaking university. She speaks English fine. She just isn't self-confident in that area. Um, and she said, I can practice presentation skills, my English skills, as well as my leadership skills in taking charge of uh, a strategic planning initiative with a department. And it would really help me. And I said, uh, yeah, I'm not going to turn that down. Um, so she spent several months with us and several hours. She would come on her lunch breaks and or after she would take time off her job to come and help us to develop these skills. Well, our department, I, I can't tell you how, how much success we experienced because of all of her help. She was amazing. So I never once thought that we ever helped her because <laughs> she helped us so much. Well, yesterday I was at a lunch and she said, she, it, it was a lunch meeting with her at a Peruvian restaurant, she's from Peru, and it was a going away party for her. There were uh, maybe a dozen and a half people in this little banquet room in the Peruvian restaurant, and they were celebrating her promotion. As the director of she said, Belinda, because um, of the opportunity you gave me, Dixie State I have my dream job. She said, Belinda, um, because of the opportunity you gave me, a pretty, I pretty have neat to see how the universe aligned, you know? Um, uh, and we benefited so much, pretty, she did too. Pretty neat to see how the universe and now aligned, she's where she wants know? to be. Uh, and it was pretty magical. We benefited so much, she did too. If you're and now she's where she wants to be. Well, what do you feel has been your most significant trial in your life? If you're comfortable you in sharing, what would this what do you feel has been your most significant trial in your life? Any life How have you overcome or dealt with this problem? What have you learned? Um, are there any life lessons you've so learned? So, I grew up in a home today? where you didn't talk about um, mental health. So, and you were I just fine. You like you just had to work harder. Um, there was nothing wrong with you. Health. You just and you just got you through were it. Just fine. Which is like great. Like I learned a lot of resiliency from, from that. You just, um, you just got through it. But the older I got, the, like, the more I, I struggled with mental health. Um, um, I suffer from but the older I depression got, and anxiety. The, the more I struggled with and mental health. earlier when I said um, I, I was getting in my own way, that's what I meant. And 
that depression and anxiety got gets in my way my not as often anymore but all growing up that depression and i didn't have a name for it gets though. in my way not i just knew i was anymore. different but and i didn't know up, how or why i, I was different it, um i just knew i was different i was sick a lot growing up how but it wasn't like a fever was sick it was stomach aches because um, I was worried about everything, but I didn't know that. But it wasn't like a um, sick, it was stomach ache. After I got married, I was worried I about everything. My husband said, You've but I didn't some, know that. There's something going on. Um, after I got and married, I, I finally said, I started, Fine, I'm going to go said, figure out what the heck. There's something going on. And once I figured it out I, and started using said, some fine, strategies to deal with my mental heck. health, or to and work with my mental health issues, my life my life started about two and a half years issues. ago. My and life, uh, my life so started what I would say is two and a half years ago. if you feel like there's something different, there probably and, uh, is. And it's not so bad. What I would say is, like I said, I have crazy like resiliency. <laughs> but it's not bad. I uh, like now I, said, I have crazy resiliency. It's not just bouncing back from but falling. I, uh, now it's jumping now forward. It's not just bouncing. So back don't from be afraid falling. of who you really are. Now it's jumping. And don't forward. be afraid to embrace the crazy so don't be or whatever it is. Who you really are. Um, don't be afraid don't to, be embrace to embrace your family's past. The crazy or whatever it Face is. Face it head on. Um, and don't be just don't be afraid to embrace your family's past. Are there any Face words it head of on. Wisdom and or just medicine don't be afraid. That you have lived by your life. Are there any words? Of yeah, definitely. So, um, one that I so I was a counselor for, especially for youth, one yeah, summer. Definitely. That's so, um, a um, summer youth I, program so for a LDS for youth. youth. Especially for youth, and one summer. That's um, you don't sleep. You live in the dorms at BYU or wherever LDS you're at. Uh, there's and pizza parties in the middle of the night. Uh, crazy. Total exhaustion for like at. nine weeks straight. Uh, there's pizza parties but in the fun. Middle of the night. Uh, One crazy. I, I found a scripture Total that summer like in the Bible that says, God hath not given One, us the spirit I, I of fear, but of power Bible and of love and of a strong mind. But Before I, I recognized my me mental health struggles, and that scripture got Before me through. I, I my and it still does. Struggles, because God has not given us the spirit of fear. Got me through. That fear doesn't come from it God. Does. It comes from because other places, God insecurities and things. He has given us love and strong mind. The other one, I'm going to have to he read to you um, because I don't have it memorized, but it's mind. one that I came across a few years ago during I'm my master's studies. You, um, because I don't have it memorized. It's from a gentleman named it's Parker one that Palmer. I came a few years ago during my and studies. Parker Palmer has written several it's books. It's from a gentleman named uh, Parker He's a Quaker. Palmer. And, and he's also a, a leadership guru. Um, uh, guru is probably the wrong word for a Quaker. And he's <laughs> but also a, he's a written some fabulous guru. books. Um, and in one of his books, I came across this quote, <laughs> and it says, he's written some fabulous "Our deepest books. calling um, is to grow in into our own authentic quote, selfhood, and it says, whether or not it conforms to some image is to of who grow we ought into to our be." Own authentic selfhood. Whether that or not it quote to some image was freeing to me. To be. So much of my life, that I focused on, well, I'm supposed to go to church every Sunday. I'm supposed to be temple worthy. So I'm supposed life, to read my scriptures every day. I'm supposed to pray at least twice a day and over every food. I'm, I'm supposed, supposed to, to dress modestly. I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to. At least twice a day and, and over every food. I'm supposed all of that to just, I don't know why, but it just it crushed me almost. And and all reading that, that I just, realized, I don't, know why, but it just I don't have to do any of that. It crushed me almost. I'm choosing to do this, and reading that, I realized, but I'm choosing to do it I don't have to do in my own authentic way. I'm choosing it's okay for to me this, to have a job. But I'm choosing it's to do okay it to get an education. In fact, way. you need an education. It's okay, for me to it's have okay a job. that I don't have children. It's okay, it's to okay get an that my in husband fact, and I eloped to Vegas and didn't tell it's anybody. It's okay that I don't have children. That was pretty funny. It's okay that my husband uh, and I we were married by this black Vegas woman in Vegas. And our our uh, <laughs> uh we were married by this the person black that woman in Vegas. I can't think of it. And our our uh the witness. Our witness what is it? The Tim Quizon from the Philippines. Didn't speak English. We found him on the, the street on witness, our way in to get married. Our witness? 
Um, Tim Quaison. But you know what? From the Philippines. Didn't that speak w- that's English. my we found him on the own street authentic on our way to get married. selfhood um, right there. But you know I what? needed that. that that's, that's how I needed to do it. And it's okay. Selfhood right there. Embracing your own that. uniqueness. And your, that's how I if you feel it. like you want to do and it okay. and it feels good. And you're not breaking laws. Your own uniqueness and your, go do it. You feel like you um, do it and it feels because good, just because it doesn't look laws, like some box that somebody's created um, in society doesn't mean it's wrong. Just because it doesn't look like that some box, box that somebody needs to be set aside for all of us. In society doesn't mean it's wrong. What advice that do you have for women in That box needs to be set aside for all of us. Probably what advice just do you have for women in Utah? Embracing who you are and being okay with it. It's okay that I have mental health um, struggles. It's okay okay that I was 29 when I got married and not 19 like I thought. It's okay okay that I can't have children. I was 29 when I got married. Like I am so grateful for my life. I have such an abundant life. So many blessings. And I think we all need to remember that. And it's not gonna look like anybody else's. And I think we all need to remember that. And it's not going to look like anybody else's. Well, I used to, I used to love backpacking, camping, hiking, all of that. I still enjoy going out and being outside. Well, I used to, I used to love backpacking. But I'm embracing my heritage now. I I learned how to can, so my pioneer heritage. I've I've learned how to garden, so I have a garden. I can from my garden, and then. Also from my neighbor's I, I garden sometimes. Garden, so I, have garden. Um, I, I have taught myself my how to quilt. So about garden, once sometimes. a month, maybe um, every other month, I, I piece to together quilt. a quilt and I'll so either quilt it on my machine or month, I'll tie it. Maybe every other month, um, I, I have lots of quilts at my house. And I'll either quilt it on my machine or I'll tie it. And I love I love the Hallmark Channel. Not gonna lie, I I could watch that for days. I love, I love Christmas season channel. on the Hallmark Channel, and I love um, I, Valentine's I Day season on the Hallmark, Hallmark I Channel. Christmas so season on the Hallmark That's what I do in my free time. I love um, Valentine's Day season on the Hallmark, Hallmark like Channel. So that's what I do in my free time. Your career or your personal life, and what would you like to accomplish? What do you feel like is your greatest achievement in your career or your personal life, and what would you like to accomplish? In I don't know. Maybe... Waking up and showing up today. Maybe waking up. Most of the time, and showing up. Each today. day is my greatest achievement because I wake up and show up. Most of the time. So each day is my greatest achievement. Uh, as far as the future. <laughs> so probably just as the far same as the thing. Future. Just keep showing up, doing the best I can. And helping other Probably people just be ha- live doing the like this I happy can. life that I've been able to find. And helping other people. What would you like be to ha- be remembered for? Like this happy life that I've been able to find. Oh, I've been thinking about that question what a lot. Because like I for? I I would oh, like to be I've remembered as a, I, this might sound kind of funny. If you're not I, a member of I the Church like of Jesus Christ of Latter day Saints, you may not Get what this means, so I'll try and explain it. If you're not, but members of the the LDS faith, they have the opportunity to receive a patriarchal blessing. But members of the um, I received a patriarchal blessing when I was about 17, and in it, there's a line that says, "You will be known and revered um, as a righteous mother in Zion." And in it, there's a line that says, "You will be." And you know, I may not ever have children, which is fine. Like, I'm actually. And I've watched those birthing videos, children, let's just be honest. <laughs> which is fine. Uh, like, but I'm actually <laughs> I hope those I can be videos, remembered be that way. Uh, I hope that those around me know I can be remembered that way. That I have faith in I Jesus Christ. That those around me I hope know that they know that that I, have I faith know in Jesus that we Christ. are daughters and sons of God. I hope that they know we are all intimately connected to each I other. Know we are daughters and I hope they would know how much love I have for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Connected to each other. And I hope they would know how much love I have for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Is there anything additional you would like to have recorded about your life? I 
I just want to, I, my husband is such a huge blessing wanna, in my life. I, my husband, I'm very grateful that he took a chance a on me. Is such a huge blessing in my life. And, uh, and that he's decided to stick it out. <laughs> uh, he says almost every day, and, uh, well, you're stuck with and me. He's and I always say back to him, I'm not stuck with uh, you. I choose to be with you every day. Every well, day. You're stuck with me. And, uh, and I always say you know, it's not him, perfect. I'm not stuck with you. I choose to be with you uh, every but day. He, and, uh, he you know, is the love of my life. Uh, but he...